Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Listen in right now. Thank you. That means you, Ali Sanjabi, A.B. Puppy, Dale Mulcahy, and brand new patron, Todd. Everybody make Todd feel Yay! welcome. Yay! Welcome, Thank Todd. Thank you, Todd. On this episode of DTNS, an exoskeleton you can just put on and walk away in, why Figma was mimicking Apple's weather app, and EV sales numbers, EV sales numbers are not what they seem. Nor are the owls. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 2nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House and also Owls, woo -woo, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are going to help you get up and go in an exoskeleton. I'm very excited about this story. I, I don't know why I love exoskeletons so much, but it's just something I've, I've always wanted to <laughs> the, become the, accessible. The, the promise is pretty cool. I know. I know. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Especially I as I get older excited about it. and it gets a little harder to get up every day, you know, need those exoskeletons to come before it's That's too right. late. Right. Let's start with the quick hits. Android authority sources say that Google plans to introduce a set of machine learning features to the Pixel 9 in August. A leaked screenshot describes Google AI as including Gemini, that's the LLM-based assistant, Circle to Search, and also Add Me, which apparently can make sure that everyone is in a group photo, even if that one person was in the bathroom when you took the nice photo. Also, screenshots to search for info in your screenshots, and Studio, which is described as, you imagine it, Pixel creates it. Sounds like image generation. It does. And everybody is comparing the screenshots thing to Microsoft Recall, which Microsoft Recall automatically did it. This is just, hey, did you take a screenshot? We can tell you what's in it. To me, those are not really comparable, but whatever. Uh, CocoaPods is a repository for Swift and Objective-C projects that's used by around 3 million macOS and iOS apps. Developers maintain the pods, and then the app makers typically incorporate those pods through app updates. That's a usual vector for what's called a supply chain attack. So if somebody can infect the pod, a lot of the app makers won't realize it. A vulnerability in a trunk server used to manage Cocoa Pods was vulnerable for decades, but the vulnerability was detected and patched last October. So that, that's good news. There's also no evidence that these were exploited. However, EVA Information Security putting out a bulletin this week saying, hey, uh, if you're an app developer who has used Cocoa Pods, especially if you used it before October. Here's some guidelines just to make sure that your app wasn't subject to some kind of vulnerability exploit. Netflix has started sending notices to subscribers of the $11.99 month basic ad-free plan that they need to switch to a new plan to keep their service active. They can choose the even cheaper $6.99 basic with ads plan or the $15.49 a month ad-free HD plan. Or there's always the top tier $22.99 per month 4K plan. Thunderbolt 5. It's going to give us 120 gigabit per second single direction speed, 240 watts of power. You can drive an eGPU off it, an SSD, even a high-res, high-refresh rate monitor. The first three certified Thunderbolt 5 cables are shipping now. You can go get them uh, wherever fine cables are sold. These are made by Cable Matters. The Verge, though, points out they only know of one laptop with a Thunderbolt 5 port that you could plug these cables ah, into. Ah, the old port thing. Yeah. And, and you'd have to have two of this laptop in order to use the cable to connect it to anything. Uh, the Razer Blade 18 is uh, available at one configuration that's like $4,800 with Thunderbolt 5 ports. But if you just want to get ready... For a bunch of Thunderbolt 5 devices that are coming soon, uh, you can get ahead of the game and get some cables now, I guess. The NFC Forum is a nonprofit industry consortium that lays out standards for how to use the near-field communication chips that power tap to play. That's using anything from credit cards to phones to do so. A new white paper from the forum describes something called multi-purpose tap. The idea is to deliver more than just the one thing per tap. So, for example... You could pay for a pack of White Claws, but also have your ID validated, get mm -hmm. loyalty points added to your store loyalty account, and even get a digital receipt delivered to you all with that one single tap. 
It could also be used to send you marketing messages. So there's ah, that. Well, there, there. Yeah. The forum is proposing a multi-purpose tap to see if the industry members might support adding it to the NFC standard in the future. I think the good might outweigh the bad there, potentially, you know? Yeah. Because I, I, mean, I like the idea convenience. of the, you know, one tap that's, to do that's for sure. all of that. Mm-hmm. So. All right, let's talk about this Figma story. Uh, if you don't know what Figma is, it's an interface design tool for developers, right? So you can you can put together what your app is going to look like. Last week, they announced Figma AI, and one of the big parts of this was make design. Uh, the idea is it would use some generative models to generate UI, generate UI layouts and component options from your text prompts. So you would just describe what you need, and the feature will provide you with a first draft. Uh, I'm making a weather app. Uh, please make an interface that shows the current temp, uh, the next day's forecast, and some other stuff. Well, Andy Allen did exactly that. Uh, Andy Allen, if you if you recognize the name, is the creator of the iPad sketching app Paper, which is very popular. Uh, he tried out Figma AI's Make Design feature, uh, and he wrote on X... The results are basically Apple's weather app. Tried it three times, same result every time. So, Sarah, since then, Figma has disabled its make design tool, as you you might have guessed. Mm. Um, Figma CEO Dylan Field wrote on X, Within hours of seeing this tweet, meaning uh, Andy Allen's, we identified the issue which was related to the underlying design systems that were created. It's a little vague, isn't it? Underlying design systems that were created. Uh, however, yeah. he took he took responsibility. Ultimately, it is my fault for not insisting on a better QA process for this work. I have asked our team to temporarily disable the make design feature until we're confident we can stand behind the output. Now, here's some interesting stuff. 9to5Mac points out that Apple expanded its Figma support in May and included design templates. So those design templates might have been used in the training, right? That's a possibility. Okay. Figma's CTO said the feature uses off-the-shelf LLMs combined with design systems we commissioned to be used by these models. The problem with this approach, which I outlined in my keynote last week, is that variability is too low. So he's sort of saying, well, it could be in the training data from something else we used that wasn't under our control. Uh, Plus, the problem uh, is that you don't get a lot of variability. So once it decides on a design, it's going to keep giving you that design. Uh, Figma says that it uses OpenAI, Amazon Titan for image generation, and Jasper uh, for background removal. But in the end, I don't know if it matters so much whether Apple designs were in the training data or not. The fact that it's putting out something that looks like Apple is the problem. It's quite possible for a model that's just trained on apps and apps in general often imitate Apple that Apple's design language would just be learned by the model anyway and it would yeah. coincidentally output Apple looking at weather apps. That was kind of my first reaction to this. Not that this isn't, I, I understand why this is problematic. Yeah, at yeah. the same time, I'm like, it's a weather app. I mean, <laughs> weather apps do kind of- How much variation can you They have? do <laughs> what they do. They tell you the weather and what the weather is for the next seven or so days. Uh, you know, And uh, as somebody who checks the weather several times per day, just because I, I want to know what, what I'm getting into, I, you know, I- it, it, it's not rockets. Well, I mean, I guess it's kind of meteorology is rocket science. The, the but interface design is not rocket the science. The interface yeah. design is not rocket science. You don't even want to get that creative. You just want the information. A weather app is a great example of an app where you're just like, just give me the information. You know, make it, you know, blue in the back or green or whatever. But, you know, the, the, the weather information is the same. I also feel like Figma CTO saying... Well, you know, maybe the training data that we bought was bad. That's another part of this that is problematic. Because if you, I mean, clearly you, you're you not going to, as a human, just sift through, you know, all this training data. You buy something, you use it, you hope it works well. Uh, the training data company that you bought the data from, they, you know, they thought it was great, you know, happy to sell it. And we get into like a weird gray area where it's like, well, if no one's at fault, okay, now well, now what do we do? I have a pro. I personally have a problem with saying that the training data is the problem at all. I I don't think it is. Uh, I think we we want there to be a simple explanation of 
if a copy comes out of one of these models, it was copying it from the training data. But as we've talked about before, that's not how these models work. They don't have a database of images that they look at and copy. What they have is a bunch of numbers that are trained off of lots of images to learn what images look like, what interfaces look like. And so it's much more likely to me that there are just a lot of designs out there that are similar to Apple's, and this model was able to recreate. That's one of the things these models are good at, is imitating and just yeah. kind of coming up on their own with the design that looked like Apple. I don't think it matters what the training data was, to be honest. What matters is this design tool should be filtered to prevent it from doing copyright or patent like uh, mm -hmm. infringement. And you have to, it's really on the designer. This is just a tool to say, here's an interface you could start from. How many, how many people do you think actually rip off Apple's design when they start and then change things so that they're not ripping it off? Probably a lot. This tool is just doing the same thing because this is not supposed to be the end result of the interface. This is a rough draft for you to then modify yourself. And I think that's getting lost in this story too. The developers aren't supposed to take what it outputs and use it. The developers are supposed to modify what use it gives. Use it as a through. reference tool. Yeah, as a jumping off point. Exactly. Right. Well, Tesla announced that it had produced 410 831,000 vehicles in its latest quarter that ended on June 14th. You might say, all right, why is that significant? Well, it's down 14% over the same quarter last year. Some more details on cars that Tesla already produced. The company delivered 443,956 vehicles to customers, which is also a 4.76% drop over last year. That was the second quarter of declines, but sales were 436,956,956, uh, which beat analysts' expectations. A lot of numbers here, I know. Basically, Tesla is selling fewer cars than it did a year ago today. However, not necessarily in hot water financially because of this. In general, EV sales, of which Tesla is definitely, you know, it, it's sort of a... Um, uh, you know, a big part of, are growing. But the company also reported its first year-over-year -year sales drop since 2020. Tesla now has around 50% of the market, and that's down from 80% back in 2020. So things have shifted pretty quickly. Yeah, one of the big reasons it's down from 80% of the market is there's a market. <laughs> there, there, are, there are more right. than like one other company uh, making EVs now. Uh, this, this was not unexpected. It, it's not great news for Tesla if you're a Tesla fan or a Tesla stockholder. Um, you know, you you don't love to see this, but it's also not shocking that we have big car makers getting into EVs in a serious way. It's going to cut down Tesla's ability to dominate that market. Uh, it's also not shocking that. That EV rates are going up while Tesla's isn't uh, because people are buying other competitors' cars. Yeah. But even if that's slowing, that fits the wider trend. Uh, the, we, uh, we, uh, Roger dug up that Cox Automotive expects U.S. sales growth of all cars to slow during the second half of the year. So I look at this as bad news for Tesla and sort of not news for EVs. It doesn't tell me anything about EVs other than EVs are kind of going along with the rest of the car market right now. Yeah. I mean, Tesla specifically is, I mean, of course it is, it, 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 it's a, a figurehead of, of, of EVs. Um, but things have changed. Things have changed quickly over the last four plus years. Um, there are reports that Tesla's production of its Model 3 um, at its uh, big factory in Fremont, California, uh, has seen some slowdowns, had some issues, supply chain issues at its gigafactory in Berlin. So, you know, this may be a Tesla problem that is not indicative of an EV market problem. Uh, although, I would say just about a year ago, uh, and just because I listened to some Carhead podcasts, you know, it was mm -hmm. sort of like, ooh, nobody wants an EV anymore. You know, it's just, it just isn't cool anymore. It's it's too confusing. People don't know how to charge them. They're afraid of uh, doing road trips. And the numbers just don't say that. No. People are interested in EVs. They so, may not be as interested in Teslas, certainly not interested in the expensive Teslas. They're, if they're yeah, interested right. in a Tesla, it's the lower cost one. Uh, but China's BYD grew 21%. 
Uh, so, you know, yeah. there's that's that's a brand that a lot of people are looking at as being on the rise worldwide uh, because it is more affordable. I think what's going away is not interested in EVs. It's uh, dollars uh, or money. People just don't have as much money as they used to. So they're not buying cars as frequently. And when they do, they're buying less expensive cars. Well, and what's interested, uh, interesting about Tesla specifically is, and I've mentioned mentioned this on the show before, way back in the day, a friend of mine had a, uh, a, a Model S, and he was like one of like the first 10 people in the world to get one. It was oh, a yeah. big deal. Uh-huh. Right. Big deal. And, you know, I, I, he let me drive it a couple times, and I was like, this is amazing. Oh, my gosh. I wish I could get this car. And... Over over the years, you know, you see more Teslas around. It sort of became like, ooh, yeah, it's like a tech bro car. And then it became more of like, hmm, I mean, they're they're all over the place. Yeah. Every time I walk around my neighborhood, I mean, lots of my neighbors have Teslas, and I'm gonna guess they're not, you know, like <laughs> orthodontists, or at least you know, <laughs> having orthodontist salaries type thing. Um, at the same time. Uh, there are so many other options, and for people who are interested in EVs, it was just inevitable. It was yeah. inevitable. Like Tesla can't stay on top. It's now just a car that is v- still luxury for sure, but it's it's one of many options that you have. Yeah, like it's more like an Audi car. or a Mercedes now, where you're not like shocked to see it, but you're like, oh, that's a higher end. You know, that's a, the bigger deal exactly. than a Camry. Yeah, right. Um, CR Poll points out uh, IBM went from 95 percent of the PC market to 60 percent in the mid 80s. Uh, and as we know, IBM's not in the PC market anymore. They sold off their PC line to the Lenovo in the 90s. So I'm not saying Tesla's going to sell off its, its vehicle-making line, uh, but this is what happens to dominant companies is they get competed with, and how yeah. they respond to that competition can be different. This isn't doomed for Tesla, but it's also not a foregone conclusion that they'll succeed. It's, it's how they respond to the competition that matters. It's one of those situations where being first is cool and also a detriment. Yeah, because the first mover as, advantage is also a disadvantage. <laughs> right, because as soon as someone else comes into market, it's like, oh no, Tesla's done for. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, the, yeah you, you just that's just how this stuff works. Yeah, uh, you know, the good news is uh, if these sales numbers are slowing, as people expect, whether you want an EV or an old-fashioned gas-driven car or a hybrid or something else, uh, prices of cars are going to be coming down. Uh, the sticker price might not come down, but but dealerships are going to be willing to make a deal with you uh, because they want to move these. And that includes Tesla. Tesla dropped the price of a lot of its models in mm-hmm. the last quarter to try to get these sales numbers back up, right. um, which they did. They got their sales numbers growing again. That's also lost in this. I thought it was interesting that the Verge's headline for this story was Tesla delivered fewer vehicles to customers for the second quarter in a row, while Bloomberg's title was Tesla beats estimates with less drastic drop in vehicle sales. Right. Yes. It's <laughs> it just it kind of, you, you know, both can be true. Yeah, both can be true. They're both accurate. They're just yeah. slightly different takes. Exactly. Well, speaking of takes, uh, as an Apple user, uh, we we're we're we know who we are. We span far and wide. We're not on Mars yet, but on Earth, uh, there are quite a few of us. Good news for us Earthlings, Eileen Rivera and I started a new podcast called Apple Vision Show earlier this year to talk about whether Apple's vision matches with what we, the Earthlings, actually want. We do it every week. It's really fun. We'd love to have you along for the ride. Get subscribed now at applevisionshow.com. Sarah, how would you like an exoskeleton? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess kind of. D- d- s- sell me on it. They only cost two hundred thousand dollars. Ooh, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you also, <laughs> after you've paid the two hundred G's, uh, you have to train them on your exact way of moving by getting on a treadmill for an hour, so the software can be manually adapted to your way of walking. I mean, that part of it doesn't bother me because I'm like, if I just dropped 200 G's, now I have to exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just one hour, just the once, right? Just the one hour. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah I can do well, that. Well, for walking. 
if you want to do anything else, you'll have to train that separately. Okay. So if you want to run or go up some stairs, some, that's, a, you know, high intensity, that's some more whatever's. hours of, of mm -hmm. training. All, um, all, st again, I've paid for it. I want to make sure that it works well. What if we could do this cheaper and without all the training, though? I would like that more it, because that I don't be have two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, scientists at North Carolina University's Lab of Biomechatronics and Intelligent Robotics have created a locomotion recognition system that supports walking, running, and stair climbing for any user. You don't have to pre-train it; you just pop it on, you know, like a suit. Okay, it's a little more complicated than that, but you just get in the exoskeleton and you can use it. Uh, they did it by using some neural networks. So they had three neural networks, one modeled on the human musculoskeletal system, so your, your bones and your muscles, uh, and how those work. One was modeled on the exoskeleton, the machine itself. So you had one on the human body, one on the machine. And then a third neural network was used to predict how a human would move while wearing the exoskeleton. So one for you, one for the machine, one for the interaction between the two. They mm -hmm. trained those three models simultaneously for eight hours. And guess what, what kind of machinery would you think they would need uh, to to train this kind of system, do you think? Well, uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, like a like a like a cray computer or something <laughs> insane. Right, right, yeah, something like that. They used one Nvidia RTX 3090, not even a 4000 series, uh, not even a 40 series, just just the 3090, uh, for eight hours simultaneously. All three models running on that one GPU trained it up. That model output a controller. They actually built that controller based on the design that was put out by the model. Uh, and then they copied the controller software that the model created into the exoskeleton. So they just, you know, cut and paste, basically, you know, oversimplifying. Uh, so the exoskeleton now had new software that had been created by the model. They had controllers created by the model. And then they got 20 able-bodied people to try it out and... Uh, the the way you the way you measure how good an exoskeleton is is something called metabolic rate reduction. So in other words, mm -hmm. you know how hard do you have to work, right? How how does your metabolism go? Got it. Uh, that that that's how you rate how well an exoskeleton is working. Uh, metabolic rate reduction for walking was twenty four percent, for running was thirteen percent on average across the twenty people, and fifteen point four percent for climbing stairs. All of those are records. That's the best any exoskeleton has ever done. Uh, and they think that the price of this could come down to $5,000, maybe as low as $2,000. Wow. You know, it's crazy because when I think of uh, metabolism and, you, you know, you, you, want, you want good metabolism, right? You know, you, you burn fat, you, you know, you, you can sort of eat what you want. Obviously, being active is all, uh, all good. So reducing that, for me, I'm like, ooh, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I want to be fit. But if you've got a knee injury, um, you know, maybe you, you're, you're, uh, you've got a, a vision impairment. I mean, there's so many ways that this could be extremely helpful to keep people from just yeah. Muscular not exercising degradation. at all yeah. to, to, to something that is uh, safer for the body that you have. Yeah. And, and not to mention the ability to lift and move things that you couldn't otherwise, which again, right. uh, as an assistive technology would be helpful for people with de degenerative diseases for sure. Uh, but also could be used in, in warehouse situations where you, you can program a robot to do this, but maybe there's just a lot of discretionary decisions and, and the models aren't quite good enough for it yet. So you really would rather have a human and the human could just put on an exoskeleton and start moving super heavy things around. Uh, certainly applications yeah. in space uh, where, you know, your muscles start to degrade more and, and you do need to, to lift some some heavy things. Granted, gravity is not a problem in space, but, you know, maybe maybe when you're down on the ground, um, it becomes an issue uh, or more of an issue. The, what the team wants to tackle next is making them quieter, making them lighter and making them more comfortable. And they want to explore 
adapting them to people with impairments like you were talking about, like arthritis of the knee, because the tests were all done with able-bodied people. So they want to see like, okay, can we make sure that these work for people whose gait, whose way of walking is, is farther from the average than the 20 people we tested it with? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, a couple things. Uh, Exo games on the horizon. I can oh, see yeah. it now. Uh, yeah. and, and I would watch. Um, yeah, if you get these things down to two to five thousand dollars, you know, a sports league could afford that with the right sponsor. You know, Red totally. Bull could fit that bill, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I guess really it it comes down to okay, well, we're all, you know, delicate snowflakes with our own issues. So if you do have a, you know, a, a very specific physical need that this could help you with, you know, is is this is this test going to be enough? Now, nah, sounds like it's you know it's an initial test, uh, and with a wider pool of folks, they're going to understand a lot more about what works and what doesn't. You know, yeah, they're just going to be- maybe the knee injury, great, great, uh, great solution. Maybe the shoulder injury, not so much. Well, we'll we'll see if the model can adapt to a wider range of uses. Uh, yeah. is, is is what they're looking at, and and yeah, uh, hopefully it'll it'll be assistive for everyone because we're all losing muscle mass the older you get, right? Uh, and so the older you get, the the more likely you could benefit from something about like this as well. Indeed. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. If you're interested in hospitality exchange, spreading peace and goodwill, and also traveling abroad, well, Chris Christensen might just have the answer for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If I said there was an organization where you can host other people in your house for free and you, or you be hosted by them when you travel, you might think I'm talking about Couchsurfing.com, but this is an organization that started in 1949 and it's Servas International, S-E-R-V-A-S dot org is their website. And it was started by some people who were concerned about the state of the world in 1949 and wanted to start an effort for peace. And that's the idea behind Servas is that when you meet people from other countries, you're helping establish good relations and that will lead to a better planet. If you're interested in joining Servas, you're actually going to have to be interviewed. Find the details on their website, Servas.org. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Thank you, Chris. You can check that out. We'll have a link in the show notes as well. Uh, Matthew writes, I've taken Uber Pet several times since I now live in Quito, Ecuador, and don't have a car. They're not terribly strict with it here, but some drivers won't accept rides if they show up and you have a pet and did not select Uber Pet. In Ecuador, Uber isn't technically allowed but the Uber pet option is an additional $1 per ride. I'm in London this week, and it's five pounds per ride here. Uh, huh. So, yeah, cheaper to add a pet in Ecuador, even though it's not technically allowed. I'm a little confused. Like, are they just, like, running under the radar there? Well, uh, which is something they did a lot in the early days. close enough to a so. border of another region that is allowed type thing. But, uh, but yeah, we, we were talking about uh, Uber and pets and, yeah, people who either need to use an Uber, don't have uh, another uh, transportation method. And, yeah, it sounds like it, uh, sounds like it can be done, but it's either not going to work out in a specific instance where you want it to or it's going to be a lot more expensive than the yeah, right Yeah, th- what, he, what he's saying is it won't work if you don't select Uber Pet. So if you have a pet, make sure you, you select that because yeah. it might not work out otherwise speaking of pets uh stick around for the extended show good day internet sarah and i are going to talk pet tech uh what have we used what have we not what's out there to try what would we like to try stick around indeed just a reminder you can catch our show live monday through friday 4 p.m eastern that's 20 hundred utc and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we're back doing it all again tomorrow with scott johnson joining us talk to you then The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>